Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris and Jesse. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. Your weekly fortnightly podcast for all things uh, guitar and gear. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Jesse. Hello. Yeah, I almost committed myself to a weekly show. <laughs> we can't do that. No, I, we can't do that. We, we don't have the content for a weekly show. Of course, we would if our listeners would email us show suggestions. That's and, true. And, and questions. Yes. <laughs> we would love to hear questions. Show suggestions. Send them to us at SST Show on Twitter, uh, six strings and things at gmail.com. Uh, or six things things at jestercat.com, actually. I think both would work, but go with jestercat. Yeah. And, or chris at jestercat.com. You can send them right to me and we can uh, do that. Um, if you like today's show, please click like or subscribe um, and follow us on iTunes and YouTube and anywhere else that we may be. You can also check us out at jestercat.com. So that's all the upfront stuff, everybody. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, I hope we haven't lost our listeners. But <laughs> if we have, oh, they'll be well. back. Yeah, I'll be back, you know. <laughs> they're, addi- yeah. they're addicted. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's a great podcast for guitars ever. Indeed. All right. So why don't we talk about what we've been up to this week, and then uh, we'll get on with the show. Sweet. So, Jesse. What, what have you been up to this week? <laughs> oh, well, you're calling me off. Okay. All right. Yes, we can, we, can, uh, we can start with me. That's perfectly fine. So I have been up to a few things this week, still hammering away at those um, four-string voicings um, for the seventh chords and, uh, had a lesson, uh, this, this afternoon and I learned a new one. Um, so I've, I've done the major chord with the root on the B, mm-hmm. G, E, and D string. And that's jumping all around. Sorry about that folks. Um, and then I did, uh, the dominant chord, uh, seventh chord with all those, uh, roots. Uh, I've done the minor sevenths on all those uh, roots on all those strings, and I've done the minor seven flat five with the roots on all those strings. And today I learned the diminished chord, which of course is the same <laughs> for every string. For root, well, I should say for the root on every string, with, right. at least with the voicing with the top four strings. So working on that, I, it was a very mentally exhausting for me uh, round today because it was nothing but these voicings and going through these different songs with these different chord changes. And, you know, I got to a point where I'd memorized all 16 of these chords and then I, uh, not counting to diminish, and then I had to sort of process them, you know, how do you make this chord change? How do you jump from here to here? And by the end of the hour, my brain was toast. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, interesting, challenging stuff. And then uh, I thought we'd talk about this as sort of the main part of the show. I've also failed at Luthery um, this past <laughs> week. Uh, we could talk about that too. Uh, don't worry. No permanent damage has been done to any of my guitars. There's never permanent damage. It's just how much do you want to spend and how much you're willing to do to fix it. <laughs> Good point. So. I would say severely damaging the fretboard of a $100 guitar is permanent damage. That's probably it's, true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then you've just got some firewood. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right, so uh, what about you, Jesse? What have you been up to? Uh, mostly the the uh, seventh chord voicings. I've been playing with them still on the on the same uh, 4 3 two, one string set as well. Oh, nice. um, and just, you know, getting two five ones and the diminished um, under my fingers or getting it better you know because that's the thing it's like you get to the point where it's like yes i know this and i can do this and two five one two one and you can do that but then it's like okay now at speed with an actual tune now you can't do it <laughs> you right. know? So, that's, that's where it matters so you see yeah. you sort of through this you would shed this stuff in order to get it under your fingers but it doesn't really matter if you can't play a song right right, right. so you know you do the uh, autumn leaves or the falling branches, whatever that knockoff <laughs> version is. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and you do it and it's yeah. like, and then that song comes under your fingers and then on to the next one. And yeah. So what? the other thing I was doing was, um, kind of noodling to, uh, well, um, playing some old maiden tunes. I was listening to the new, um, Iron Maiden album and new as of, I think last year actually, and the Queens Rec album from last year. And, uh, they're pretty good actually. <laughs> I haven't heard them. So, I'll yeah, check them out. so I mean, if anybody's into Queensryche, which is, I don't know how many people even listen to I mean, that's a band from like, primarily the 80s, early 90s, you know, when they were big. And uh, 
they since about 94 i guess 95 um they had uh, promised land was the last like what i thought was a good album that was like 94 and since then it's kind of like meh and uh so now they got a new singer and um he sounds like the young old singer sort of <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> Um, uh-huh. He is younger, although he's not like a, a puppy. He's still kind of older than average. But, um, yeah, it's just great. And um, they've got more energy and it sounds like the old stuff. And I haven't really gotten into the songs. The hooks haven't sunk into me too much. But anyway, so I was listening to that and just sort of noodling and soloing along with that. And uh, getting in my 80s vibe to go along with the 251s. <laughs> right. It's an interesting mix. Yeah. So yeah. that's my guitar week. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, how about birthdays? Any birthdays this week? I have a few, in fact. So, oh, nice. Mark Twain. I actually have one, too. Do you now? Yes. Oh, wonderful. But go ahead. You go first. Okay. So, first we have uh, George Benson, March 22, 1943. Um, Eric Clapton. Can't forget him. Um, uh, March 30th, 1945. Angus Young, March 31st, 1955. And Muddy Waters, April 4th, 1913. So, he's been around a while. He has been around for a while. Well, he's dead. Yes, so, he, uh, yes he's dead. But, yes, but he's uh, definitely, I mean, you can't, you can't understate, uh, overstate, excuse me, the importance of his uh, contributions to blues for sure. Absolutely. Um, and rock and roll too, because I mean, a lot of oh, the yeah. early rockers, I mean, you know, Rolling Stones and I think Clapton and a lot of those guys were Muddy Alt Waters fans. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And definitely influenced and inspired by him. Uh, George Benson, who is he? So uh, a jazz player um, who got into sort of adult contemporary in 70s and 80s, um, although I think he still played jazz, you know, I mean, depends on where you saw him with what kind of band, um, but a really great jazz player as well. So. Cool. I just wanted to make sure that just in case there's like, you know, some people in our audience who are like, George Benson, is that the, the guy on that TV show or uh, <laughs> so? Yeah, no, no, honestly, jazz guitar player. Excellent. Uh, I have a birthday. We're slightly off. I should have probably done it last show, but I just it just came to my attention on March 3rd of 1986. Master of Puppets was released. Oh, yeah. Not a person's birthday, but it is an album's birthday. And it just popped up on my Facebook feed. Now that Master of Puppets is 30 years old, I'm like, oh, when did that happen? <laughs> yeah, I looked up the album and sure enough, March 3rd, 86 was when that album was released. It's a weird thing. You know, you get my age and it's kind of like people say like, well, 10 years ago and, and you automatically think 90s. Right. <laughs> I'm so out of touch. <laughs> right. But that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. Master of Puppets. That was I'll tell you what, battery, you know, when that thing kicks in, it's just, uh, it's just brutal. Yeah. Great song. I think my favorite song on the album is Disposable Heroes. Oh yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, I like that song. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great songs on that album. No it's, doubt. It's really, it's nice because, um, I like the songs on Ride the Lightning a lot. Um, mm-hmm. but the production wasn't as kicking. I think Master of Puppets of the early Metallica was probably the best production you know what i mean because we're yeah. aggressive and it sounded really good um justice was had great songs and and they were brutal but for some reason the sound just wasn't very full i mean especially like the drums the kick drum was this really kind of slappy sounding you know what i'm talking about yep it just yep. wasn't that full so you know after master of puppets it was sort of a little bit of a sonic letdown even if the songs were awesome yeah i mean um Damage Incorporated, another great song on the album. Mm-hmm. Um, Master you know, Puppets. Obviously, Master of Puppets. I like The Thing That Should Not Be. That was another... I, I mean, I like the whole album. There's not a song on here that I don't like. And in fact, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Orion is the last instrumental on a Metallica album. I think that's true. I can't think Because there another... wasn't one in Justice, and then they went with the Black Album, and I don't think they've done another instrumental. Yeah. Now I wonder, wasn't Master Puppets Cliff's last album too? Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. Jason. So I don't know if that had something to do with it or not, but uh, yeah, I was going through the, I was going through my iTunes library after I'd heard that Master Puppets was turning was turned thirty and started playing it earlier today, and I was like, oh, that's right, Orion. Yeah, I forgot that was on there. And yeah. It was a great song, and yeah, pretty sure it's because they did an instrumental on um, Kill 'Em All. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, I don't think there's one on Ride the Lightning, though. 
I think Call of Cthulhu was. Oh, Call of Cthulhu. Yes, yes, yes. That slipped my mind. Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, Metallica. I'd love to hear another instrumental again. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I don't think Metallica listens to our show. But in case they do, you know. <laughs> right. we, That's like true. To, James, yeah. come on. How about it? <laughs> so, all right. Um, so, so those are our birthdays this time around. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, my failed attempt at Luthery this week. <laughs> uh, so, boys and girls, don't try something unless you're really certain you know how to do it. Um, <laughs> Taking the chainsaw to your guitar to change the body shape is not a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's not what I did. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, winterish time. Actually, it's more like spring now. But as everyone knows that has a guitar, as the seasons get colder, the fretboard begins to shrink and you contract a little bit and you get those frets that stick out, right? The wood contracts more than the metal does. So what do you do? Well, Anybody with a lick of sense takes the guitar to a luthier and has, says, please file down these frets for me. Uh, but that's not what Chris does. No, Chris gets a bright idea. He's like, you know what? I've seen this done on YouTube. I'm pretty certain I can do it. I can do that. That's, so I got some uh, awesome tools. Right, right. So I go to my uh, handy um, hardware shop and I say, hey, I'm looking for files. And they're like, well, what are you going to do with these files? I'm like, and I told them, I was going to file down the fretboard, frets on my guitar. And I found this really cool video online where they took the fret and they ran it at an angle right along the edge of the fretboard. So it's just, you know, it was just going right on the frets. It wasn't touching the wood, so on and so forth. And the guy looked at me and he's like, I don't think you, probably what he was thinking was, I don't think this guy has any business getting a file near his guitars he clearly does not know what he's doing so he goes why don't you try sandpaper first we have metal sandpaper sandpaper for metal and i thought yeah so what i could do is i could you know take this and, and tape it to some kind of wood block or whatever and i could run it right along just like a file and if i do hit the wood hey it's 220 grain sandpaper right <laughs> how bad could it be how bad could it be <laughs> So uh, I get home and realize I don't have a suitable block of wood for this. So I, I, I taped the sandpaper to a paint stirrer, which actually worked quite well, uh, at least in terms of, you know, giving you a long, flat sort of surface to sand with. And then I started sanding away. And, uh, yeah, I nicked the fretboard a few times on uh, – the first guitar was like my cheapest guitar. I was like, you know what? If I screw this up, it's not that big of a deal. At whatever. least you did them in the right order. Right. <laughs> and and I thought, you know, this is better. And I started playing it a little bit. Like, this is better. I think I might nick the fretboard here or there. But I learned my lesson. Let's go up to my next, you know, least expensive guitar. And uh, start going at that. And, you know, I'm, I'm seeing metal filings coming off. You know, it's taking a while, but I'm seeing stuff. And I think I'm starting to see a little bit of wood come off, too. I'm like, okay, I better stop. Checked it out. And it seemed like it was a little better. It's like, all right, now it's time. I think I've learned my – I'm broken in. I think I've learned what I'm doing here. Now it's time to grab the 339. Now it's an Epi 339. It's not like I'm doing it to a $2,500 guitar, which <laughs> I would not even think about doing. And uh, so, but I do like this guitar very much. And it's, oh, yeah. it's there. You can see it. It's back there uh, on my wall. Um, and I start sanding away. I start sanding away. I start sanding away. And I start to notice, you know, that dust coming off is awfully white. I'm like, oh, crap, that's some of the binding. So I immediately stop. I, you know, brush off the guitar, start playing it. I think I might have made it worse, a little mm. bit worse. Not not a lot worse, but a little bit worse. So, yeah, the lesson here is don't do that. <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine. I mean, I played it, you know, a few days ago right. and it was like uh, – don't I now I don't remember. <laughs> it's not like I played right before and after like you did. Um but it felt good. I mean it was fine. So I, if you made it worse, it wasn't really a big deal other right. than you you, the, the, you know the fact that you took a little bit of binding off. Yeah. Although I'm wondering about that. I mean why since the frets still protrude a little bit beyond the binding, I'm trying to f suss out why you could have gotten a bit of binding. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, well, I'm wondering. I, some of the frets aren't as far out as others. So as I'm running the length of the fretboard, it's possible that you know I'm pushing down on wood in some places and metal in others. Yeah, the guitar definitely gets worse as you go towards the body. Right. You mean the frets stick out more? The frets, the frets yeah. stick out more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's, that's what I meant. Yeah, the frets stick out more. And so I, I think I probably applied some uneven pressure and probably did a couple of nicks here and there. But learned my lesson. Uh, mm. I'm going to let the spring happen, summer happen, let the you know the moisture expand that fretboard a little bit, and then next February, after it's been cold for a while and dry for a while, check it out again, and if it's still pointy. We're taking it to a luthier. Yeah, there you go. And I think uh, you're right in that February is probably the month to do that. Um, yeah. If we have anybody of a different opinion, please let us know right in the uh, in the comment section. Um, but I think um, like the coldest month in the Northeast, you know, uh, USA anyway, is January. Of course, this advice varies depending on your location. Yes. <laughs> if you're in Australia, this is not good advice. Um, but uh, yeah, so the coldest month being January um, and February's just behind it, you know, so I, I think you have that time for the dry air to, to do its bit before it starts warming up in March. So I think February is a good time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, for who, depending on where you are, two months into your winter is probably yeah. is a good time. It's going to, it's going to contract as pretty much as much as it will. Yeah. Likely. And, you know, it's a good time to take it. Um, yeah. So lesson learned. Um, not a luthier. And don't try it again. So, and you know, at least I didn't go to like my Paul semi hollow or something like that next. I had the sense to stop. Right. And you know, binding is kind of its own, it's probably softer than like a hardwood, I would think a little bit. Uh, I'm willing to be corrected on that. Um, and so, and some of the woods, I mean, I know my fretboards, like the, the ebony ones, I don't think there's a finish there. So even if it took a little bit of wood off, it's not really a big deal. It's just it took a slight amount of wood off. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I think, you know, good on you for trying. <laughs> yeah, I should have just stopped at the second guitar. I should have said, you know what? Yeah, but but hey, it's not like I went to my Strat or something like that and said, all right, let's keep going. Yeah, that's true. But I have to say, um, playing my guitars this winter, I've noticed that my Mexican-made Strat has f fewer actually hardly any frets sticking out and my yeah. american has you know one or two right and so i have to say that that uh that mexican uh strat that i have plays really well now remind me what the uh the fretboard materials are on those two uh maple on the <clears throat> american and rosewood on the on the mexican well that's interesting yeah. I would think that the maple shouldn't shrink as much just because it's finished. I mean, if you have a hard finish, right. it shouldn't really lose moisture to the degree that um, a naked piece of wood would be. Although rosewood's a fairly oily wood and doesn't – the worst of my guitars tends to be my ebony fretboards because they're not finished and it, ebony tends to be a little bit of a drier wood and it, I think, dries out more. Right. So, you know, it's good to um, – you know, oil the fretboard a little bit before winter. That's what I usually try to do. Although you still get the effect. I mean, yeah, you, it's hard to avoid. And um, just one of the things you just have to live with as a guitar player. But, you know, take it to somebody who can file it down for you. And then, you know, you'll have it okay playing guitar in the winter. And then when it gets to be summer, it'll be a real nice playing guitar. Yeah, that's you true. Anything sticking out. Um, actually, we should talk about now a little bit. It's, it's becoming springtime. Yes, it at is. Least. You know, at least here in uh, north central Pennsylvania and many parts of the country, we've had an unusually warm winter in the U.S. And, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm not a big fan of snow, so I'm okay with this. Um, but uh, it is time to start thinking about, you know, spring guitar. What, what should we do as the season? Because these guitars are made of wood. And as the seasons change, the humidity in the air changes, these guitars are going to change a little bit. Um, yeah. so this is the time of year to, to go through your instruments and just play them and see how is this wood changing? Um, you know, do I need to reset the action? Do I need to file down a couple frets? Do, you know, what do you need to do? Do you need to change the neck? You can, you, we talked about my telly on here a lot. You can guarantee that telly is going to need a neck adjustment here. <laughs> in the so. yeah. uh, always does. 
that's a weird thing about guitars. I mean, they're so individual. I mean, you know, wood is an individual thing. And uh, because the telly doesn't have a particularly thin neck, you know, and uh, and yet that one seems to move a fair yeah. amount. And I've got like one of my Parkers has as thin a neck as I've ever played. And that thing is just rock steady. It just doesn't move. Um, and it has like a, um, and in fact, I think it has like an oil finish on the back of the neck, which after having owned it for five years, I haven't even oiled it. So I should probably get to that at some point. But yeah, I mean, it just, I don't know why that is. You know, is there something in the manufacturing? Is it just the luck of the of the tree? You know, I don't know. I think it's probably a lot of that, a lot of luck of the tree. Yeah, because I have another one that does move a bit. So, you know, that one, I just um, tweak it a little bit with a truss rod adjustment, you know, twice a year. And it's pretty good. Are these bolt-ons? Yes, both are bolt-ons. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a telly. Um, I don't know if that... Again, who knows what it has to do with it, um, but yeah, it's definitely twice a year you have to adjust that truss rod because the action just gets real high and it's not the saddles, it's, yeah. it's the neck. Um, but yeah, so, you know, wipe down your guitars, change your strings, whatever it is you need to do, take, you know, turn on Netflix, watch a couple movies while you maintain your guitars, or at least the ones you like to play a lot anyway. That'll be like the new thing, Netflix and Tweak. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, what I do um, is I like to keep a Excel spreadsheet mm -hmm. with um, sort of updates. When was the for each guitar? When were the strings changed? And the last time I changed the strings, what did I do to it? Did I adjust the action? Did I change the intonation? What you know? What did I do? Um, neck adjustment. What are the types of strings that I put on there? Because you know right. sometimes it's like. You know, like, oh, I probably shouldn't have left those uh, uncoated strings on my guitar for a year and a half. Oops. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then if they're coated, like, you know, some of the lectures, I'm like, yeah, you know, four months go by. I don't play the guitar a lot. I can let this go another month. You know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's – it's. Uh, I think it's a good idea because I have en enough guitars now that I just can't keep track of when each one has been last strung. That is really good. That's actually – I'm impressed. I have never done that. <laughs> and uh, that's a really good idea. You know, <laughs> so people do that. <laughs> yeah, like a little maintenance log, you know, yeah. and just they didn't, I can see, you know, when they've been last taken care of. Sure. Because, uh, you know, I realized uh, my Yamaha Pacifica, uh, last time you were over, you'd mentioned that the fretboard was looking a little dry. And I looked at the my maintenance log and I was like, yeah, the last time I changed the strings was, uh, I think new year's Eve, uh, 2014. So well, 2014 to 2015. So yeah, you know, like, Oh, well, um, I better change those strings pretty soon. I haven't quite done yet, but I will soon. Yeah. Um, that's when I keep down to a half step. Um, and you know, if you have a maintenance log, you probably know that from playing it, but if you could keep, you could keep that information there as well to remind yourself the next time you restring it. Oh, you know what? I want to string this a half step down. That way you don't string it to full tension and realize, right. Oh, you know, it's, and then you maybe have problems keeping tune. Uh, also if you do tune down for those of you that haven't tuned down before, um, I would recommend if it's your first time tuning down, change the strings and keep them to that tension for a little bit and look at the neck and mm -hmm. see if you need a truss rod adjustment because you're yeah. having less tension on the neck. It may uh, bow less. And so you may need to, um, you know, adjust that truss rod a little bit. Right. Yeah. It's good advice. So yeah, it's springtime. It's weather's getting good. Check out your guitars, people. And if you're not, you know, um, comfortable with some of the things you can take it to uh, your local guitar guy uh, repairman luthier and uh, have him show you some of the basic stuff i don't think they would have a problem saying here's what you might do with the truss rod here's the way you turn it to you know and, and show you what the relief looks like and, and that right. sort of thing because um i'm not so sure that those are the most enjoyable things for those guys to do you know what i mean well and you can see videos like that on youtube but it's you know it's usually good to have someone show you it's a comfort level yeah because Absolutely. if you're not used to seeing how much an, uh, an effect you get with a certain amount of turning, I mean, you, you might turn it too far and yeah. So, or not even realize that maybe your truss rod isn't working correctly, whether it's a loose nut on it or whatever it might be. Um, and that could be pointed out to you, which is good. Right. So yeah. it's all up to you guys, you know. Yeah. I remember you, you came over to my house and showed me sort of 
this is what you do for the trust rod adjustment. I'm like, oh, okay, well, this makes sense. And, you know, I have a sense of now, I'm, you know, I don't think twice to whip out an Allen wrench and, or, uh, uh, yeah, Allen wrench and just go at it. So, sure. Um, yeah. So it's a, if you're a little afraid about that, don't be. Just right. get someone who knows what they're doing, talk to them, and they'll show you. And it's really not a big deal. That was right. definitely like the, my biggest concern about basic guitar maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's hard to something. It was, was yeah, because the trust rod is where you really can screw up. Yeah. But you have to do something crazy, like, you know, try to turn it, like, I don't know, a half turn or something like that. Well, more than a quarter turn. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, when you're sort of in the danger zone. So, um, yeah, just be careful. But have somebody come over and you know what you're doing. If it starts squealing, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stop yeah. right away. That's almost always like, that's a universal truth there. If you're doing <laughs> something and something's squealing, you should probably stop. Yep. Uh, let's see. Amp maintenance. Is there anything for change of season? I can't think of anything. Not for the amps I use. <laughs> yeah. You know, solid state amps are pretty much bulletproof. Um, tube amps. Um, it's not really a seasonal thing. It's more of a, um, a behavioral thing. So, uh, and I don't really – not being really a tube amp player, um, this is stuff that I've just heard from other people who are. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is more for people who uh, – because there isn't anything in, in the dryness, which is what you get in the winter seasonal changes in a house. Right. But if you play out and you take it to you know have it in, in the car overnight, it's cold, whatever, that kind of thing, um, just letting um, tube amps acclimate to the temperature – so if it's cold because it was in the car, don't take it right into the club and fire up the tubes and get it hot immediately. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, let it, you know, acclimate first and vice versa when you leave the place too. So, of course, then there's reality. It's like, I want to get out of the club. <laughs> I'm not going right. to hang around here, you know. So right. uh, there's reality. But, um, yeah, so that kind of thing. I think that's the only thing with amps. Everything yeah. else is just sort of fix it as it goes if you've got a microphonic tube or something like that. Um, you should, you'll hear, you know, problems and then you take it to an amp guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think with amps, just, it's like any other piece of electronics. I mean, even with, um, computers, you know, you want it, it's better to get them at the temperature before you turn them on. If you right. Them the car. And in fact, I treat my guitars that way. I don't let my guitar stay in the car more than 20 minutes unless it's a real nice day. Like we're talking like room temperature outside and it's in the trunk. Yep. You know, other than that, I take it in with me or uh, and let it come to temperature in the, t in the case before I take it out and play it um, as long as I can. Now, yeah, obviously, if you're driving somewhere and then you're going to a lesson, you're going to a show, you maybe have to just start playing it immediately. And that's one thing. But, you know, it's it's wood. It's metal. It ha the tensions change and all of that. If it gets cold or hot or whatever, it's just, you know, better to, uh, you know, just let it come to temperature before you sure. mess around. And the big rule usually <clears throat> on any of these things is if you're comfortable, your equipment's comfortable. So, you know, even on like a fairly mild day, like today is like 70 couple degrees or something like that here. Um, you know, if it's very sunny and your car is in the direct sun, you can get an internal temperature higher than is comfortable. And oh, that, yeah. can, that can be uh, true for your guitar as well. And um, the more exposed wood, the worse. I mean, the worst would be like an acoustic guitar, you know, because there's right. so much you know, wood that's not – the whole inside of it basically is not finished. Um, but even electric guitars, I mean, glues can soften, especially like on you – when know, we get to the summer days. Oh, if you yeah. have 120 degrees in your car, don't leave a guitar there. <laughs> and it can very easily get to 120 degrees in your car in the summertime, 130 even. Um, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Don't leave the guitar in the car. Don't leave dogs in the car. Don't leave children in the car and don't leave guitars in the car. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't mean to belittle those other things. <laughs> if you're not comfortable, none of those things are happy. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Um, so now in addition, this is not having to do with um, season changes, but it is having to do with sort of treating equipment well. I was watching a video online the other day and it talked about breaking in the speaker on an amp. <laughs> yeah yeah and so i had not heard of this before and so what mm -hmm. this individual had done basically was uh put a loop pedal on plug the, the amp in and basically just let the amp play fairly loud you know this individual put the um the amp down facing the floor with right. that little angle and that way it wasn't so loud out in the room or whatever and i uh, did that for about five hours to let the amp break in i have to admit um he 
did a before and after video, uh, and there was a difference in the sound. Mm-hmm. But I've never done that before. Well, hmm. the problem is there's a lot of um, it's hard to get to the root of what's really going on because there's kind of a lot of confounding factors. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this has been a thing in like the audiophile world for freaking ever. OK. Um, yeah. So and the thing about it is most uh, manufacturers of the drivers themselves, um, I say, shouldn't say most, some break in the drivers after manufacture. Some don't. And so it's kind of hard to know, you know, what's going on. And the way it works is um, there's two kind of pieces that affect the compliance of the driver, how much it will go in and out. And that's the uh, – if you look at a speaker, the, the surround, the part where the cone actually kind of joins to the, the basket, you know, mm-hmm. and that that will be rubber or foam or whatever that is. That's the part you can see from the front. If you take a speaker apart, you'll see in the back there's also what they call the spider, which sort of joins the back part of the cone to the – the back end of that assembly near where the magnet is. And those are the moving parts, essentially. Okay, everything else should stay stiff. Right. But those things can break in. And there's sort of two levels of it. I read a white paper about this. And um, essentially, the first like five minutes does most of the breaking in. And it doesn't really have to be loud. So just, I mean, in home theater and home, you know, audio, pretty much the, the thing is, look, just enjoy your music. It'll sound a little different. After it breaks in a little bit, but there's really no, um, you know, reason to go crazy with it. After it sits without having moved for a while, it gets uh, it loses a little bit of compliance, also, but not back to where it started. And okay. so you kind of get that effect every time you play it, sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, but that goes away very shortly. Um, I've heard just you know a minute of playing or something like that. Having said that, okay, this is one opinion out of like. Seven billion. How many people are in the world? <laughs> because you'll have actually manufacturers have uh, some of them will say that's it's a myth. Don't worry about it. And other manufacturers will put right in the manual, break your speakers in right. and audiophiles, you know, half of them will say, yeah, you got to burn them in. And others will say that's silly. Um, the effect from the white paper that I saw is like, yeah, it's measurable. It's not that big of a deal. Um, but again, your mileage may vary. But how do you know that what you hear is, you know, the difference? I mean, did he say it put the loop on and then he recorded at the, you know, that same exact loop at the beginning? Yeah. And then at the end? Yeah. 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 It was the same time. Actually, I think what he had done was you know, the loop was used to break the speaker in, but uh-huh. he played a riff before and a riff after on the guitar. Right. And um, so my question is, is like, okay, well, if it wasn't a recording, could it have been just differently played? I mean, and I'm not saying he's, it's not right. And, right. and what I've read has been in terms of like home stereo speakers, you know, audio mm-hmm. file type of thing. So it may be that the manufacturing sort of practices, burn in all that stuff is totally different in guitar amp manufacturers. And maybe they don't do any of that. And yeah. maybe there's a bigger difference. I mean, who knows? I, I, don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. It, it caught me off guard. I was going through my normal, you know, sort of YouTube rounds the other day. And I, and I saw that and it was a review of an amp and I'm like, I had not heard of that being done before. So very, very interesting. Um, And then I guess we should say for those of you acoustic players out there, we kind of shortchanged you on our, our discussion of what to do for the spring. Uh, I honestly don't have an acoustic that's worth (laughs) worrying about. Uh, (laughs) Mine is carbon fiber. So it doesn't care. (laughs) Yes. So, I would suggest that you not take advice from us on what to do for, <laughs> I don't know. I well, should, I should, I should speak for me. You should not listen to me. Jesse probably knows a lot more about it than I do. The, the thing about make sure it's, you know, it's comfortable for you goes, I mean, yeah. for acoustics too. The biggest difference with acoustics is they, everything that affects an electric affects an acoustic more because there's just more surface area. There's more unfinished wood area and so everything, everything that flexes the dry air, everything will affect acoustic to a greater extent. So to the point where like I don't have a humidifier in my house anymore, but when I had wood acoustics, when I had a nice tailor, I would put a humidifier in the room, you know, or sure. at least a humidor in the case so that um, it didn't dry out too bad in, you know, the winter months. Because then you get um, much greater um, shrinking and expansion and then you'll get this checking and the finish will start to crack and the glue will uh, not be happy. And 
So yeah, um, definitely Google, you know, acoustic guitar, winter care, usually yeah. summer, it it'll, might change the playability a little bit, um, but it's not going to hurt the guitar uh, other than the leaving in a car kind of thing. Right. Uh, but yeah, and the, the manufacturer's website should have information too. About, oh yeah. It yeah, go to it, Martin or Taylor or Collings or any of those guys. And I'm sure they'll have good stuff. Yeah. Or the store you got the guitar from, wherever the case might be, just, you know, there are better sources of information on this particular topic than us. I guess right. that's what we're trying to say. Much more experienced people out there uh, with this than we are. So, I have one right. final comment, though. Oh, <laughs> on, yes. On the breaking in the speaker. Oh, what yeah. if you actually like the sound of the speaker before it's broken in? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like I have to record all my stuff in the next hour, or it's going right. to not sound as good. <laughs> well, I guess you have to buy new speakers all the time. I have to buy a new amp all the time. Oh, but, that's uh, true. Get really good at speaker replacement. <laughs> Trade them in. I'm that, sorry. That, that just would, came into my head. <laughs> that would be an expensive problem to have. So, all right, folks. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for this episode. We hope you uh, liked what you heard. If not. Uh, and you're like, oh, I am so sick and tired of them talking about this. <laughs> you can change it. You can send us an email, uh, chris at jestercat.com and say, hey, Chris, I would like you and Jesse to talk about blah. And if we know something about it, we'll talk about it. And if we don't know something about it, well, we'll just make it up. We'll talk so, about it anyway. <laughs> all right. Well, it has never once stopped us from talking about something. You know? So please follow us on Twitter at SST Show. You can also post those show um, suggestions there. You can check us out on the web at uh, jestercat.com. And until next time, everybody, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things of Guitar Adventure is a Jester Cat production. For more on the show, please visit www.jestercat.com. You can follow us on Twitter at SST Show, and you can email the show at sixstringsandthings at gmail.com. Thanks to Jesse for playing the intro music.